the fifth chapter of the book of First Corinthians, and uh, I just thought there was something I was writing a little on this morning that I think would make a very good uh, preface. It would fit right in with this study. We're in things about the church in Paul's letter to the church at Corinth. I think this would help. Now, what it is, is the part two of uh, the chapter in the book that I am now writing called A Voice Cries Out Amid the Wilderness of Religious Confusion. The world isn't religious confusion. It doesn't know that, and it doesn't know why. And it is a very much mixed-up world. It only knows the people in the world know they love this world. They, they don't want to uh, be moved out of it. They want to stay in it. And yet it's causing them nothing but agony and trouble. It's full of violence, full of everything wrong, contention and upset and everything wrong, every unhappiness every misery, every woe that could come on human beings. And the world doesn't know why. And actually, the world doesn't want to be disturbed. It doesn't want anything else. It wants to go right on. Now, while we're here talking this afternoon, there's a very great deal of activity going on in New York right now. Also, some in Washington and other places in the East, but primarily right now in New York, as the Democrats are getting ready for their national convention beginning Monday evening. Now they're just fighting back and forth, everyone tearing out each other's hair, everything to get the, the, the self-advantage and get the advantage away from the other fellow. And that is the process that is being gone through in this world in choosing a president of the United States. And this is supposed to be God's country. We have printed on some of our money, in God we trust, but nobody does. Nobody believes that. I don't know. I think maybe when that was originally put there a good many generations ago, maybe, maybe the ones who put it there were sincere. But nobody's sincere about anything like that anymore today. Well, the chapter I'm writing now is what and why is the church? Now, I had just completed the first chapter on that, and the first chapter is pretty thick here, 24 pages of manuscript. But it is pretty largely preliminary, and it explains a lot of things, and brings it up to the present point, and there will be another chapter that will run as many pages. And I have completed, and I was working on it this morning, and I have completed now the first eight pages. I'd like to read those eight pages, because I think they fit right in here with Paul's teaching about the church, and some of the things are going to be written in this that we're even going to go through here today. And this is uh, chapter 9, part 2, on what and why is the church. So let me just go through this rather quickly. Most in the Western world have simply taken the existence of churches for granted. It never seems to occur to people to question where did the church come from, what is its purpose? Why should there be a church? Why, when did they exist? Well, ever since you were born, you've known there were churches, and you suppose they just always have been here, and you, don't, you never seem to be interested in inquiring. Why are they here, and is there any reason? Is there any purpose? Now, to continue this, to the average mind, I suppose, a church is a building with a steeple atop and a cross on its facade. People, at least some of them, 
go to this building every Sunday morning as a place of worship together. Indeed, Webster defines it thus. You look in Webster's dictionary, what is a church? And you say it's a building where people congregate for worship, whatever worship is. I don't know what they mean by worship because I don't think they know what they mean. To many, probably most, the church plays no part in their lives. Indeed, God plays no part consciously in their lives. God is not consciously in their world. Just people and material things and interests. And that's all that ever enters their mind. That their whole mind, their whole thoughts, attentions, and interests are on those physical, material things and people. Yet the church does exist. But why? What is it really? What purpose does it serve, if any? Just what and why the church? In this volume, we have seen that there is indeed a purpose being worked out here below. There is a reason for the presence of humanity here on the earth. And uh, for the working out of that purpose, there is a supreme master plan. Never lose sight of the setting that led to the raising up of the church. And of course, that's all gone before in other chapters in this book because this is chapter 9. There have been eight other whole chapters now before this. We have seen in this volume that God is the Creator, that all things were brought into existence by Him. We have seen what and why God is, and even what, basically, He is still creating holy, righteous, perfect spiritual character. We have seen that he first placed angels, apparently a third of them, on the earth before the creation of man, that he placed his government over them with the super archangel Lucifer on earth's throne. Lucifer led his angels into rebellion, and the government of God became inoperative. We have covered the creation of man and the prerogative of the first man, Adam, to qualify to restore the government of God by rejecting the rebellious way of Lucifer, then turned Satan, and to choose the way of the government of God. We have seen how this first Adam rejected God as ruler, as revealer of knowledge, and as giver of eternal life, and how Adam made this choice for all his offspring which should form the world of humans, and how God decreed that all mankind, since Adam had made that decision, that all mankind, except those minutely few whom God would specially call to his service, should remain cut off from God, as Adam had cut himself off, and God's Holy Spirit for 6,000 years until the government of God should be restored. Now, we haven't quite come to that 6,000 years yet, you know. This purpose being worked out here below involves the supreme, matchless accomplishment God is reproducing himself. That's what God is doing. And in so doing, of course, he's creating holy, righteous, perfect character. This has required a master plan of many steps during a span of 7,000 years. We have seen that in the uh, time sequence of God's master plan, there are four important untils, where the word until plays a very important part. One. Mankind, as a whole, would remain cut off from God until the government of God is restored and Satan is removed at the second coming of Christ. Now, we're still going on in that. Second, the gospel message announcing the future kingdom of God could not be proclaimed to the world 
until, now here's the second until, until Jesus Christ, the second Adam, had qualified to restore the government and usher in the kingdom of God. Now the kingdom of God is different from the government of God, remember. By A, overcoming Satan, and B, fully accepting allegiance to God's law and God's government. He had to qualify by denying the government of Satan, so to speak, and accepting the government of God, in other words. Now, third until, God's church could not be founded and endued with his Holy Spirit until, now another until, until Jesus had ascended to heaven and been glorified. Now you get that in Acts 7, verses 37 to 39. I don't mean Acts, I mean John. John 7, verses 37 to 39. Now fourth until, even then, the church could not be born of God until Christ's return to earth in supreme power and glory as king of kings ruling over all nations. Now, what it means to be born again has already been gone into in part one of this same subject. The church could not be born of God. People talk about they're already born again. But the church could not be born of God until Christ's return to earth in supreme power and glory as the king of kings ruling over all nations and the time of the resurrection of the church. Now, you've got to understand something about the church to understand that. And people in the world don't understand that at all. And we might add the fifth until. All who die, that is, all mankind as a whole, uncalled, and therefore unjudged, which means neither saved nor lost, prior to Christ's return, and that means all from the time of Adam, prior to Christ's return and rule at his second coming, shall not be resurrected for their time of judgment until after Christ's millennial reign, at the end of the 7,000 years of God's master plan. There is a vital reason for these untils. And I don't think you've ever heard this stated before. It's never been in any of our literature that I know of. I have used it once or twice, too, come to think about it, in some book or some article some time ago. So, once again, what and why is the church? The church is the called out, that is, from this world, begotten children of God. It is the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 12, 27, Ephesians 1, 23. It is the organized spiritual organism that uh, is, shall be the bride of Christ after the church's resurrection to immortality married to Christ. It is the spiritual temple to which Christ shall come at his second appearing. He's not coming to a temple built of stone like he did the first time. The temple he's coming to this time is the church, and nobody seems to know that. In fact, we haven't known it. I've only been proclaiming that within the last year or two. The church could not be actually founded until Jesus had ascended and been glorified. John 7, verses 37 to 39. But, in a sense, God began calling out some to form the foundation of the church with Abraham and the prophets of the Old Testament, or even, perhaps, with Abel, Enoch, and Noah. Ephesians 2 and verse 20. And Jesus, immediately after qualifying by overcoming Satan, began calling out his future apostles to form with the prophets the very foundation of the church under Christ himself, who is the real foundation and head of the church. Second Corinthians 3.11, which we went into last Sabbath, 
and Ephesians 5.23. The average person has no conception whatsoever of the tremendous, supreme, supernatural achievement that Almighty God has undertaken in reproducing Himself ultimately into billions of spiritual God beings. And every human being, every child can become one of those God beings, absolutely supreme, so far above what any human being on earth is now that it's like a billion times more important, more powerful, more knowledgeable. They have no conception of the many faceted stages of development necessitated in this pinnacle of divine accomplishment. You see, this is the pinnacle of even the accomplishment that God himself could do. That's how great it is. God could not hurry. It required a master plan which must proceed a step at a time. It required patience and never-deviating determination on the part of the divine Creator Himself. Few understand this. From a child only five years old, God put it in my mind and heart to desire, to literally crave understanding. Solomon desired wisdom, and God gave him wisdom above all who have ever lived. What, then, is the necessary prerequisite to receiving understanding? Well, that's what I wanted. I, I've craved that ever since I was five years old. But, of course, I just wanted understanding in the physical and material realm of things at that time. Quote, A good understanding have all they that do his commandments, unquote. The one test commandment is the fourth, the keeping of God's Sabbath. My conversion resulted from a struggle to resist that commandment. But when a merciful God conquered me, brought me to surrender to him on that point, he revealed also the necessity of observing his annual Sabbaths and festivals. These picture major spiritual steps in God's great master plan. Through this revealed knowledge, and through the revealed knowledge of the Holy Bible, God has, through these many years, now at uh, age 88, revealed to me understanding of the working out of his grand purpose and the necessary part of his church in that purpose. After Adam's rejection, with Satan still active, God knew, as only he could know, how cautiously, gradually, a step at a time must be the procedure. And he's going to turn what he created in that physical Adam, and an Adam who rejected him, and so to speak, just spit right back in God's face, and turn them into supreme God beings. Now that's going to take over 7,000 years and it's going to take many different steps one at a time, and people have no understanding of that. Now, why and what is the church? It is one of the great steps in that plan is so very necessary. Such righteous men as Abel, Enoch, and Noah undoubtedly were used to play some part in the ultimate creation and establishment of the kingdom of God. But the Eternal began laying the actual foundation through mortal humans of that ultimate God family through the prophet Abraham. Isaac, Jacob, Joseph formed a part of that foundation. Then through Moses, God raised up the nation Israel, God's first congregation or church. They were given God's government, but not the spiritual mind of the Holy Spirit. They were not begotten as future God beings, not the ancient kingdom of Israel. And yet ancient Israel was a necessary part of God's supreme program 
though not a spiritual part. Nevertheless, during those years, God continued to call to beget and to prepare individual prophets as part of the foundation for the future church. And what, then, was to be the church, as pictured by the third of God's uh, annual holy days or festivals? It was to be the first actual harvest of mortal humans being translated into the spirit-composed God beings. However, the church is the begotten and not yet born children of God. But the church shall be the firstborn or harvest, Christ being the foregoing pioneer, at Christ's coming in power and glory. I need some reconstruction of that sentence, but you get the point. The church, when it is finally changed from mortal to immortal at Christ's coming, will be the first fruits, the first harvest. And we, in a sense, are because we get uh, an earnest payment of that now. We get the, by the Holy Spirit, which only begets us, but we're not yet born into the kingdom of God. Through the years, from Abraham until Christ, God had called out of Satan's world, begotten and prepared prophets as the preliminary sub-foundation of God's church. Jesus himself is the main foundation. During Jesus' three-and-a-half-year earthly ministry, he called out, chose, and uh, trained the second sub-foundation of his church, his original twelve apostles, starting with Peter as the chief original apostle. During his human earthly ministry, Jesus announced publicly the future kingdom of God. He taught and trained his apostles as he proceeded. But he did not call the salvation the public to whom he preached. He didn't call them to salvation. He didn't try to convert a one of them. Rather, he said in John 6, 44, No man can come to me. They couldn't do it if he asked them to. No man can come to me except the Father which sent me draws him. And God hasn't picked them out. God hasn't chosen them. God hasn't decided to draw them. It's only a few that God selects here and there that has a chance to come now. Now, does that mean that there is respected persons with God? Oh, no. Those of us called now are called to battle against Satan. We're called to have to overcome Satan. We're called to a much harder time to gain salvation than others. Others will get it in either the millennium or in the resurrection and the life to come, and there won't be any Satan around. They all know every external influence they'll have will be a God-ordained influence. They'll have everything going for them. We have everything going against us. We have to fight the world because it's Satan's world. We have to fight Satan. But there's one difference. If we overcome, we shall sit with Christ in his throne. We shall reign with him. We shall be kings and priests. We shall be given power over the nations to rule them with the rod of iron in the time when God is beginning to save them. We get a greater reward, but we have a much harder time. It's much harder to be uh, converted and saved now than then. For them, God is choosing us who have to go through this to help them when their time comes. No one understands this truth. No one is preaching it. Billy Graham knows nothing about it. The Roman Catholic Church and the Pope at Rome know nothing about it. The head people in the Methodist Church and their top bishops, they know nothing about any of this. Just think. And think of the responsibility that in our small church, small in numbers, yet God has given us very great power, 
that we should have such knowledge. But Jesus did not call the salvation the public to whom he preached. He preached a message to them, but he did not call them the salvation. He spoke to them frequently in parables. And why in parables? To cloud and to hide from them the meaning. Matthew 13, verses 10 to 16. Read it. It wasn't given to them to understand, but he, to the disciples he said, It is given to you to understand. Jesus devoted his three and one half years largely to teaching his apostles his gospel message and God's spiritual way of life, contrary to the lifestyles of this world swayed by Satan. When he had finished the work that he and the human flesh was appointed to do, he submitted to being put to death by crucifixion, shedding his life's blood. Thus he took on himself our human guilt for our sins. He paid for us in our stead, conditioned, of course, on real repentance and faith, the supreme death penalty that all humans have incurred. He did not take on himself Satan's primary share in our human guilt. I wonder how many understand that. Christ only took the sins of humans who can repent and be forgiven on himself when he, pay, he paid our penalty. He did not take on himself Satan's guilt and did not pay the penalty of Satan. Satan has to suffer his own penalty. That's brought out by another one of the annual festivals. I might put that in here, the uh, Day of Atonement. The foundation for God's church had been laid. That consisted of Christ, the basic foundation, and the original apostles who, with the prophets, form the substructure foundation, because the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. Now, let's see, didn't we read a week ago of how the foundation that Paul had laid was Christ, and there can be no other real foundation. Christ is the one main foundation. The apostles were chafing at the bit to get started. They wanted to get out and start proclaiming this message right off the bat. To go out proclaiming that gospel message. But God uh, had to use restraint to be patient, to take a uh, proper step at a time. So, because he's dealing with people, and you can't just change these people all at once. It's a long process. So Jesus cautioned his apostles, wait, he said, or tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with the power from on high. Luke 24, 29. That's another one of those untils that I stated before. Ten days later came the annual day of Pentecost, or the Feast of First Fruits. Now that's as far as I have gotten. Now, I, I made a note, because I didn't have time to go on with the rest of it, of what will continue. And let me just give you a little brief part from uh, uh, my note. Uh, there were 120 that were present when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, and the church started with that 120. Then Peter preached a sermon. Now, if you will notice, read Peter's sermon all over again in the second chapter of the book of Acts. He did not urge people to come and hit the sawdust trail. He did not ask them to come up and uh, uh, kneel and pray with him and he would pray for them. He did not urge them to get converted. He did not urge them to receive Christ. You can't find a bit of high-pressure salesmanship of trying to get people converted in that great sermon of Peter. And yet that first sermon, inspired by the Holy Spirit, resulted in 3,000 being converted that day and baptized. 
Now that I have to write yet. Then a day or so later, 2,000 more were added. But God was adding to the church such as might be saved. Now understand, the church is the body of Christ. It is a spiritual organism. Ephesians 2 and Ephesians 4 and other places in the New Testament. It is the household or the family of God. It is a, a compacted and organized, compacted in every joint. It is so well organized and put together. God has set certain ones in the church until we all come to uh, spiritual adulthood and ready to go into the kingdom of God. And there is a system of teaching, starting with the apostle. There are no prophets now in the New Testament. They were all in the Old and no prophets formed a part of the administrative or the preaching system of the New Testament the church. But uh, as we're going to read when we get to the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians, there are many different offices of uh, administration in the church. The church has a work to do, and there are different ones to be appointed to those offices. Now, others only back them up with their prayers and with their tithes and offerings and, and their encouragement in every way like that. But the church is organized and compacted into every joint, and it's like a building all put together. Now, pieces of lumber or pieces of stone out somewhere or will be taken off of the building are no longer part of the building, are they? Well, those that go out from the church are no longer part of it. And it's the church that's going to marry Christ is the church is going to be resurrected, not individual Christians. Now, as we saw already in 1 Corinthians, there's to be no division. We are all to speak the first thing. Or the other, other scriptures, 1 Corinthians 12 and Ephesians 5, show the organization of the church, which will be covered. The church must put out any so-called rotten apples that turn sour and turn the wrong way. Uh, Romans 16, 2 Thessalonians 3, shows that we are not to even eat with any of those that are turned sour and going the wrong way. We must put them out, and we're going to come to some of that in today's lesson. Now, this is a point I want to bring out today as we go through, and it'll be in this book. The past sins are forgiven and forgotten. It is present sins that we must put out those that are presently sinning, not because of something they did last year, last month even, if they've repented of it. There is not a one among us that hasn't sinned. In Ephesians 2, in verse 2, where Satan is called the prince of the power of the air, that's working on the children of disobedience, it says that, that we were walking out in the world and sinners just like the rest of the world until God brought us in and we repented and turned away from that way and were forgiven through the blood of Christ. But it's present sin that is to be put out of the church, those who are now sinning, not those who did sin and have been forgiven. The church is the mother of us all, and we are like a fetus in the womb of the mother as yet unborn, being fed by the mother, being protected physically by the mother. The church is the mother feeding the uh, Christians and protecting them from spiritual harm and feeding them on spiritual food. Now, what about abortions, about individual Christians? Well, if an individual fetus by... Uh, if, if you could have an individual fetus by artificial insemination and the fetus, I think they're experimenting now to try to produce a human being outside of a mother's uterus and try to do it just by wholly artificial means. I don't think they'll be able. And if they are, that is not a normal childbirth. What about other churches? Revelation 17, 5 shows that there is the great harlot and her daughter churches, or the pagan religions. They are no part of the church whatsoever. Those put out, 
as we're going to see not right away in this study, are put back into Satan's world, given back to Satan again, to be saved in the judgment, not to be condemned forever, but to ultimately be saved in the final great white throne judgment. The purpose, then, of the church is to back the apostle getting the gospel of the world as a means of and preparing for the second great purpose, perfecting character within each individual in order to reign and to rule when the church under Christ is going to compose the kingdom of God and to then save the rest of the world. And that's when there will be billions of people finally converted absolutely billions. Now, I think that ought to give you a little insight into what and why the church is. The church is that body of people that finally have received the kingdom of God. It had to be prepared. The God had to first have the uh, prophets of the Old Testament and much of their writings form a foundation of the New Testament church, then the apostles, then the church organization to teach those in the church and to bring the church along. The church is then to become the kingdom of God. The church will become the kingdom of God. The rest of the world then will turn to the rest of the world and begin to bring them in to the body and into conversion. And how that will be done? Well, I want to tell you there will be a church after Christ comes in the millennium, and there will be but one church. And people will either be in it or they'll be out of it. And if they're out of it, they won't be belonging to Satan because Satan won't be around anymore. Then in the great white throne judgment, all that are converted during the millennium will be part of the kingdom of God, teaching and ruling, when billions upon billions of other people, beginning clear back with Cain and Seth, the sons of Adam are going to be resurrected. The people of Nineveh are going to be resurrected, as Jesus plainly said. The people of Sodom and Gomorrah will be resurrected in that judgment, and the book of life will be open, and they will have their chance to repent and receive what Christ has done for them and to come in with the rest of us and come in to become actual God beings after all. That is a wonderful purpose of the eternal God. Now, I thought that would be good right at this point in going through this book of 1 Corinthians to get a little bit of a, an insight in the, what is the church and how God is prepared for the church from the very beginning of everything. Now, let us go on. And I, I'm going to read primarily from the Revised Standard Translation today. I may refer now and then to King James also. But we're beginning now with chapter 5 in 1 Corinthians. And remember that this letter to the Corinthians is corrective. The things were wrong in the church. They were not all believing the same thing. They were getting into factionism. And one was a Paul man. I'm a Paul. And uh, another was a Cephas man. He was of Peter or Cephas. And uh, another was of one of the other men. And another said, well, I'm an individual Christian. I'm of Christ. And Paul then showed Christ is not divided. There is one church. And that church is organized. It is compacted. It is all together. Now, in the church today, we've had the same thing. And we've had to put some out, because that has had to be corrected in the church of God. Now, the church at Corinth had to be corrected. Things were wrong. And we've been seeing some of the things. Now then, we're going into something else that was wrong right now. So Paul continues here. It is reported, it is actually reported, that there is immorality among you and of a kind that is not found even among uh, pagans. For a man is living with his father's wife. I want you to notice, it's not a man did do that some years ago and has now been forgiven and repented of it. 
it isn't a man who did do it and has turned away from it. It says here that, and that's where this translation brings it out, as it really is better than the King James. Uh, it is reported that there is existing now immorality still going on, that uh, a man is living with his father's wife. That's apparently his stepmother. Because if it was his own mother, I think it would say that. That wouldn't be likely. And you are arrogant. King James says puffed up. In other words, they were watering down the truth. They were doing what some ministers have done in the church today. They were saying, well, that's all right. We, we, we got to be a little bit liberal. We got to allow for a few reasons. After all, we're all human, you know. Well, I know there was an ad about the Volkswagen. It was about if something happened to it in Paducah. It said if it uh, poops out in Paducah, that there were plenty of uh, parts to repair it there, no matter where it happens in any kind of a town or city. And they said, after all, the Volkswagen, could something could possibly go wrong, but if it does, there are plenty of spare parts around to fix it right away. After all, the Volkswagen is only human. Something could go wrong. Oh, that's, that's, that's the way they want to say it. They're only human, so it's all right to sin. No, it isn't. Sin is something, I know we do it, but we must repent and ask God's help to turn away from it and take the blood of Christ to pay for it up to this point and don't do it again from this point on. Now, sometimes you do do it again. What about the man who uh, swears off of smoking? And I have known of men who swore off smoking 40 times a day, two whole packs of cigarettes every day. And every time after every cigarette they swore off, they're never going to smoke again. Well, I know a man who was always filled with remorse. But tomorrow was always another day, and he was right back at the same thing again tomorrow. That is not repentance. Repentance is remorse and is being sorry, but it goes a lot farther than that. It's being sorry enough that you turn away from it. Now then, what about someone that is trying to break the habit of smoking? And he does swear off, but he goes back and smokes again. Well, he's got to pray harder, and he's got to get divine help, and he's got to work on himself. And God will have patience with him if he doesn't overcome it, and if he does take the next cigarette or two, or even the next 15 or 20, if he's trying. And if, if he's really gaining ground and is overcoming and is, is finally going to get rid of it entirely. You don't overcome every sin or every habit all at once, bang, just like that. But God looks on the attitude, and God looks on the heart. Where is your heart? Where is your attitude? Are you trying to overcome it? You know that nearly always when anyone accuses someone else, they are the ones themselves who are guilty of the very thing they're accusing. And the one they accused probably never did it at all. Now, that's going on in the church today. We're still human. Satan is still around, and Satan is getting to our people today just as he did back in the days of the Apostle Paul almost 2,000 years ago. Now, Paul says, you're arrogant. You know, you're, you're, you're liberal, and you... Uh, yeah, you're arrogant because you think, well, we're good enough. We can be merciful. We can overlook a thing like that. We're merciful to this guy. And we can't, besides, we can't put a brother out of the church, you know. Paul says, ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. Here was a church that had been watering down the truth, and we have had ministers right in Pasadena at the very top, right next to me, and men who are in charge of the ministers. 
who were watering down the truth, who got out what they thought was an intellectual thing. Here's a copy of it lying on my desk, that infamous book they got out to try to set forth the doctrines of the church, doctrines that Christ never put in the church at all, but watering down and saying there is no promise that God will ever heal you. Now, I want to tell you that James 5, 14, and 15 is a promise, and God stands bound by that promise and will keep his word of healing. But they don't understand it, and they don't know how God does it. I had learned that lesson the hard way one time a great many years ago. And that's been over 45 years ago I had learned that lesson. A long, long time ago. For though absent in body, that is, he was not there in person, I am present in spirit, and as if present, I have already pronounced judgment in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, I want you to notice something there. The apostle can pronounce judgment. The apostle has authority, and that authority is to act in the name of Christ. In other words, he has been given the authority of Jesus Christ, and it is Christ that is back of his order. When he said here, I have already pronounced judgment in the name of Jesus Christ. A man comes banging on your door and says, Open up in the name of the law. What does he mean in the name of the law? He is himself is not the law. The law is something that was passed by a state legislature or by Congress or some lawmaking body. He is a representative of the law, but he is the same as uh, has the same as power of eternity to act for the law. It's just like I give an attorney to represent me, power of attorney to act for me, and when he does it, he does it in my name, and it's just as if I did it, and it's just as authoritative. So I want you to notice there is authority in the church, and the apostle bears that authority. Now, some of them don't like that today in the church either. We've got them in the church today that they don't like that. On the man who has done such a thing. When you are assembled, and my spirit is present, with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Now, what does he mean? In other words, when the Pharisees came to Jesus, and they said, We be not born of fornication, they were accusing Christ of having been a bastard. They wouldn't admit that he was fathered by God through the Holy Spirit. They claimed that he was an illegitimate child. They were guilty of what they accused him. And Jesus said to them, they said, we are Abraham's children. He said, if you were Abraham's children, you'd do the works of Abraham. But you are the children of Satan, your father, and his work you do He's a liar from the beginning, and you're liars. You are the children of Satan. I can show you more than one scripture where Jesus Christ himself says that the unconverted people in this world are the children of Satan. Now, the people in the church today, directly or indirectly, and most of them indirectly, are my children in the Lord. But those that are unconverted, whether they realize it or not, are actually the children of Satan, and so were all of us until we were brought in. Now notice what Paul is saying here. When you are assembled, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Now that is, he will die in this life. But then he's going to be resurrected. He'd be out in Satan's world. That's what it means. Put him out of the church. And when he's put out of the church, he I don't care what he professes. He can say, I'm a private Christian. Or I'm joined another church. 
Maybe he joined the Associated Church of God, or this or that or the other, and they have no right to take the name of God in such churches of men. The Lutherans at least named their church after Luther and not tried to name it after God. But he says, and uh, now why are they to do this? That his spirit. I think you'll see in the King James it says the spirit. That his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. And that day is the, the day of the Lord Jesus begins just before Christ's coming and goes all the way through the millennium and extends on through the great white throne judgment. So the part of the day of the Lord that this is talking about is the great white throne judgment after the millennium. And in that he will die and then he, uh, maybe he, he can be saved then. But he should not contaminate the church. In other words, if you got a rotten apple in the crate, get rid of that rotten apple. Don't try to. Don't think you're saving a lot of apples to save the rotten one. It's not a good apple. Your boasting is not good. They were boasting on their own righteousness and being so broad-minded that they could be compassionate, and uh, they were more compassionate than God. God says, "Put this man out." Through Paul. But they said, oh, well, we, we must be kind. You know, we must be loving. People misunderstand love and compassion and mercy. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? You've got a rotten apple in a crate. It'll leaven the ones, uh, rot the ones next to it. They each will rot the ones next to them. Pretty soon the whole crate is rotten. Or a little leaven, leaven's a whole lump, same thing. Cleanse out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump. Now he goes to a little bit of a analogy here, uh, corollel or whatever you call it, of going into uh, one of the feast days, of the annual feast days, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened. For Christ, our Paschal Lamb, has, or Christ, our Passover, I think it is in the King James, which probably is even better, for our Paschal Lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us, therefore, celebrate the festival of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote you in my letter not to associate with immoral men. Now, that is not to associate with men who used to be immoral but have changed. That is not what he said. It's men that are now still immoral and continuing in their immorality. Let's get that distinction. not at all meaning the immoral of this world. Because you have to do business in this world with some of the people in certain... But that's not a fellowship. That's not a Christian fellowship. That's a different type of association. Or the greedy and robbers or idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of the world. You couldn't even live on the face of the earth. And where would you go? I don't know, maybe go to the moon or Mars or someplace. But rather, I wrote to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is, see, is, is now guilty of immorality or greed. Or is, not was and used to be, but is an idolater, a reviler, a drunkard, or a robber not even to eat with such a one. And if he's professing Christ in the church. Now, I could go to uh, lunch and have a lunch with some man in the world, and there's a reason in, in, in my work for Christ to do it. I've done that quite often. Jesus went to dinner and, and had dinner with sinners. Jesus himself did do that. But that was not to have fellowship with them. And even then, he only told them truth. 
I have had to have certain business dealings with men in this world. And I can tell you of men who have quit smoking and quit other things by their association with me, and I never mentioned a word about it to them. I didn't need to. I didn't try to talk them out of smoking, and yet they they just gradually had to clean this up and that up, and, and uh, uh, they didn't drag me down to their level because I didn't let it happen that way, and we don't need to. However, don't go into any unnecessary fellowship with with that, if it's part of your business, if it's part of your job, if it's something you have to do, you can do it without it becoming the fellowship that uh, is going to influence you their way, rather influence them uh, in the God's way with you. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? You see, he had a lunch or a dinner or something with an outsider once in a while, and so did Jesus. But he didn't judge them, whereas in the church, we have to appraise one another, not necessarily judge in the sense of condemning, but sometimes we do have to make a judgment about the capacity and ability to handle this or that or the other thing. Is it not those inside of the church whom you are to judge, God judges those outside, drive out the wicked person from among you. And that's the man who was then presently wicked and had not repented. Now that comes to chapter 6. And there's quite a lesson in that chapter if we get it. When one of you has a grievance against a brother, now notice that says a brother, not someone outside. Does he dare go to the law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Now, if it's someone outside of the church, you can't go to the saints about his case because they have no jurisdiction over him. But the church does have jurisdiction over those in the church. And there we have jurisdiction. Do you not know that the saints will uh, judge the world? That's why the church, the, one of the reasons for the very foundation of the church is it's being taught so that when the time comes, we can convert the world. Satan will be put away, but we're going to judge the world and we're going to save the world, not to condemn the world. And in this case, it does not mean condemn, but make a judgment as to their merits or demerits and make a wise decision. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world, and if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to uh, try trivial cases? Do you not know that uh, we are to judge angels? We're going to even judge angels. How much more matters pertaining to this life. If then you have such cases, why do you lay them uh, before those who are least esteemed by the church? Now, I want you to notice something there. When you go to law, you're going before those that are least esteemed by the church. The church is supposed to know that there is no justice in the legal courts of this world. We do not esteem the legal courts. They are not honest. Now, there was something in the news that I believe was just last night about a judge guilty of immorality of that kind. Do you ever hear the old saying that all lawyers are liars? Well, I almost believe that sometimes. Maybe not all law lawyers, but <laughs> a great many of them are. No, but the judges in this world are the least esteemed by the church. I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no man among you wise enough to decide between members of the brotherhood? But uh, brother goes to law against brother and that before unbelievers. 
Now, after one has been put out of the church, he's no longer a brother. Remember that. But this is talking about those that are in the church. To have lawsuits at all with one another is defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Now, Wayne Cole brought that up to me when the state of California launched this uh, unconstitutional fight against God's church. They said we should suffer wrong and let them take over the church and try to run and rule the church. Now, if you've read my co-worker letter that went out within the last week, about a week ago or a little more, you saw that in that letter I used the illustration about in start of the work. I decided to go on, on radio to get the gospel out. And I would have to have gone, if the uh, Attorney General was running it, I would have to go to his uh, appointed uh, receiver, and he would have to decide whether I could spend the money to preach the gospel on radio. There were people to be baptized, and I had to go down to uh, San Antonio, Texas, and have a meeting before people, and I was to baptize a few and to speak before a bunch of uh, so-called uh, Christian businessmen at a morning brunch meeting. And uh, he would have to decide whether I could go and baptize those people. He would have to have decided whether I could obey Christ and go into all the world and preach the gospel. Now, I was talking to Mr. Rader just this morning, and he just got back from Boston, New York, and Washington. And he found that that impressed many people back there, and he let one of them read that whole co-worker letter. And they said, well, that makes sense. They said, an ex-judge can't decide whether someone could do this or that or the other thing in the church. They don't know anything about such things. So why not suffer wrong? That is, if you have to suffer wrong at the hands of a brother rather than going to law outside. It's not talking about the things at all. In other words, there, Wayne Cole was misapplying this scripture, just like Satan misapplied the scripture when he was tempting Christ. Satan quoted the scripture, too. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? Well, I have done that, too. It all depends. But to see someone come and destroy the work of God, that's another matter. Then we're going to defend. We're not fighting them. We're not trying to harm them. We're not trying to, to overthrow or destroy the office of state's attorney. We're just trying to prevent him from destroying the church. We're not trying to harm the state's attorney in any way. But you yourselves wrong and defraud, and that even your own brethren. See, he's talking about the things you do with your own brethren here. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the immoral, now those that are continuing in immorality, remember that's what it means, not those who perhaps had been but have now repented and turned from it, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, now, that doesn't mean if a man ever committed adultery that he could never be forgiven. It doesn't mean that. It's those that are unforgiven adulterers, that are still adulterers, present tense. Nor sexual perverts, and in the King James it says, abuses of themselves with mankind, is talking about homosexuality there, which is a form of sexual perversion and a mental perversion, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards. And by the way, we've got some drunkards in the church. No drunkard is going to get in the kingdom of God. You know, in the world, they've got to help for that. They can go to Alcoholics Anonymous, and it seems to be successful for them. We've got a far greater help if you go to God for help, but you've got to mean it. A man who is a drunkard has got to want to get First, it begins with he's got to acknowledge that's what he is, and they won't acknowledge it. 
A man who was drinking too much is the last thing in the world he's willing to do is admit it. He doesn't want to admit it. But he's got to admit it. He's got to acknowledge it. He's got to take it to Christ. He's got to get down on his knees and ask God for help. I need help. I can't do it alone. But he's got to try to the limit of his own ability. And God isn't going to do it all for him. God's just going to do what he can't do. He's got to try to the very limit of his own ability. And not short of it. Nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor robbers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now that's those that are still doing it's what it's talking about. Remember that all of those things are things that can be forgiven and can be overcome through Christ. And such were some of you. Now here it is. But they've now been forgiven, don't you see? They're not anymore. You were. That's past tense. But they're not those things any longer now. But you were washed after that. You were sanctified, not set apart. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean justified to continue doing it either. It doesn't mean it made it all right. It meant that Christ paid the penalty for you. And in the Spirit of our God. All things are lawful for me, that's a quote, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be enslaved by anything. All things are not expedient. I think it's in the King James there somewhere. But uh, all things are not expedient. Things are lawful for me, but I will not be enslaved by any. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. And uh, God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for immorality. Now he begins to come into that, and as we approach the seventh chapter, he's going to devote a whole chapter to immorality and marriage and uh, such conditions. And God uh, raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Now before, he was talking about the church as a whole being the... Uh, temple of God and, and the temple of the Holy Spirit, but now he's talking about each individual person having a body that is a house or temple of the Holy Spirit. Shall I therefore take the members of Christ and make them the members of a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who joins himself to a prostitute becomes one body with her. Now, that's pretty plain language there in the Revised Standard. That's pretty plain language. That makes him part of the prostitute, then, I think, wouldn't it? For, as it is written, the two shall become one flesh. But he's quoting that from what God intended in a, in a holy and righteous marriage relationship. But he who is uh, united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. He who is united to a wife becomes one flesh with her and she with him. But when you're united to the Lord, we are one spirit with him. Shun immorality. Every other sin which a man commits is outside the body. But uh, the immoral man sins against his own body. Now, one thing I want you to notice there. It does not say, and this might mislead some people. Some people might uh, think that says that immorality is the worst sin. It's worse than the other sins. It does not say that. As a matter of fact, it is my judgment and I think I have the mind of Christ. And it is my judgment that fleshly immorality is a far lesser sin than rebellion against Christ and disloyalty against Christ and things like that. 
I think that sins of that kind are far worse in God's sight. Now, you go back and take examples that we find in the Bible and like in the Old Testament. Look at the sins of some of the ancient men and how God continually forgave them. He called David a man after his own heart. But David had not only the case with Bathsheba, but David also had many wives and many concubines. However, if you will read through, and you just have to read through chapter after chapter all at one sitting to really get it and get the story thread, David finally put away all of the concubines. And David finally put away all wives except Bathsheba. And God had finally approved that after David had repented the affair with Bathsheba, and she became his wife. She was his wife right until death, but at the end of David's life, he was the husband of one wife only. He had gotten rid of all of the others. But at one time, Christ said to him, or it was God in the Old Testament who really was the one to become Christ, he had said, look, you had all these concubines and these wives, and I would gladly have allowed you to have more. But he, God was trying to show him that some of his spiritual sins and rebellions were a whole lot worse. And they are worse than just the physical sins. I think I have to say that right at this point, that the spiritual sin is sin, and it's bad enough, certainly. But spiritual sins are worse. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you so that there becomes a spiritual involvement there, if you notice, which you have from God. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. You don't own your own self. Christ bought and paid for you when he died on the cross. Now, in my conversion, instead of receiving Christ, I gave myself to him. And that is exactly what went on in my mind and what I did and what I said and what I prayed. I, I said, I am no better now than an old, worn-out hunk of junk that isn't even worth throw, being thrown in a junk pile. But I said, Christ has bought and paid for me, and if he can use this worthless self of mine, I'm giving it to him. But I can't see how even God could use anyone as worthless as I am. That's the way I felt. So I gave it to him to find out what could he do with such a worthless self. Well, now I've got some detractors that still like to tell people about how worthless this self is. But God has done quite a little with this worthless self. And I haven't done it. Jesus Christ has done it. But he did use me as an instrument, and he made me go through just as much and work as hard and suffer as much persecution in fact, even more than as if I was doing it all and Christ wasn't even in it. As a matter of fact, if Christ hadn't been in it, I wouldn't have been persecuted, period. I just wouldn't have. And that's the way it is today. Now, we come to a rather long and a very important chapter, the seventh chapter, and we're up to that now. And that has to do with a very important decision that has been made recently in the church. And, but perhaps we'd better leave that for next time and, and uh, hit that flesh from the beginning instead of, I took time to read eight pages of a the manuscript there. So uh, we'll let it go for that for this time. <laughs>